So Father, I thank you again that we can gather. I thank you that these folks are all rather crazy. And Lord, I just ask that you make them crazier. Because masquerading as a normal person just takes far too much energy. Because you are an abnormal people, right? You're supposed to be peculiar. So Lord, help us know why. <laughs> And why was, are some more peculiar than others? He was staring at you when he said that. Yeah, you know, it's right over this whole group here, you know, that section of the room. Lord, we love you, and I just call up now what you want to have done. Lord, this is about your heart imprinting. Please, just do in here some of what you've been doing in me all day. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so, good news and bad news. No. I mean, you could go to somebody who spends a lot of time really scribing out every note and practicing and rehearsing and everything else, and it would be flawless and precise. Or you have me, <laughs> which, which is usually means that what happens on a day like today is that I've just been kind of swallowed in the grace all day and um, and then I try to come a little bit out of that and okay <laughs> but here's my thought is that the more that he imprints on me then when you're here it comes through regardless you know kind of whatever is here or whatever I say and don't say so um, that was my prayer for that that it imprints the heart and um, those of you who are here to hear some of Ruthie Young, um, she and Kim have been very, very convinced that I'm a mercy, if you look up what that is. And uh, that's a, a John the disciple and David and, and uh, Joshua. It's an interesting combination, but it's deeply passionate. And the heart is always having to do with this. The passion is about the holy of holies and the fact that the curtain gets ripped open. And the intent every time is just to help you get there, right? That's it. That's it. I mean, because I really don't want you to go out better informed or whatever, because that might or might not do anything to you. It might just make you, as Jesus said to some, twice the child of hell as before, right? You're just better informed, right? We want you transformed by his presence. And, and that's always my longing. So if I stumble around or whatever, it's just, that's my heart. And I think you're here because you know that. Because my heart is for each of you and what the glory is in you, but I also know that it can only get released to the degree to which you get in the glory. Right? Glory to glory with ever increasing glory. So it's always my intent, but my frustration is that this is supposed to rip open and boom, right? But instead, generally, either because of us, the church, and how we do it, or because of what the enemy does and the lies, we build a brick wall again between that inner sanctum, right? of the holies, of holies, the most intimate place. And we get signs up like this, danger, keep out, um, no shirt, no shoes, no service, right? In other words, there's a dress code to this. You want to have your act together before you get in real deep with God. Um, authorized personnel only, that wouldn't be you, right? That's why there's a banister and a railing and the pews are back here and everybody really holy is up here, right? And all that stuff, and even this one, you know, if you haven't been here recently, don't even think about it. Right? And all of that's just in a lie, and it's, it's just, it so ticks me off sometimes how we allow those barriers to get there, okay? It's just, it's frustrating. I, I know for the most part that the people behind it are not trying to do that. It just, it just happens. It's gravity. And you know what? A lot of times it's because people don't want to go back there. Right? This is like back at Mount Sinai again. Oh, no, no, no. Don't talk to us, God. Have him talk to you, Moses, and then you can interpret. We don't, we, we, oh, no, 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 no. So it, it's, it's a codependent kind of thing. But we want to keep moving forward because we're in this progression of time. You know how we're doing it. The fourth month, a couple of months ago, the month in, in Scripture called Tamaz, is, is connected to the idolatry and to that impatience and, and going back to the old. And then the fifth is, is here, we were here we were calved and here we are cowed, cowed by fear. Only we resist going over because of the fear we have. 
and so we come out of those two months which are really a tight squeeze and then we come into now this this month the sixth month that we're in now and it's part of this 40-day cycle and the first one you know it's an up down escalator that Moses is doing and the first one he goes up there to get with the Lord but then he's got to come down again because of the golden calf and he and then he spends 40 days and nights in prayer and fasting so God just won't like <laughs> wipe out the people and then he goes back up for another 40 and we're in that period of time now when Moses says show me your glory right so and this is all leading up because where this is going to end us is the day of atonement where the high priest would go before the Lord and take the blood and the people would know oh we have we have a holy God in our midst we live and he lives with us there's a dwelling port and so there's a clock and for, for most traditional Jews they will blow the shofar every day because it's a wake-up call each time wake up okay prepare it's funny because right in the church we do this whole thing uh, around Easter time, you know, which is actually the Passover, right? In 40 days. Biblically, it's actually now with the atonement. Because Jesus is going to show up and you're not going to be ready to do anything. He's going to pull you into salvation. But once you're in salvation and walking with him, there's an ongoing process. And so this is the time of wake up and uh, teshuvah, which is, is the Hebrew word for return. Okay, come back. And the more that I was thinking about, the question is this, is about where it's going to. There's kind of this door, right? Does that look like a scary door? or It's a little bit, right? Because there's clearly glory or something behind it, or danger. But it's leading us to this day of atonement, where there is both danger and glory. There's both love and this part. I love this quote, right, from C.S. Lewis. Who knows who said this? Safe? Who said anything about safe? He's not safe. Where's that from? Are they talking about Aslan? Yeah, it's a Chronicles of Narnia, right? Mr. Beaver is talking, I think, to Lucy. She goes, well, he's safe, right? Safe? Because where it's, he's not safe, so that's part of that encounter and atonement, but then it's coming to a celebration. It's a big party. It's tabernacles. Celebrate the fact that you have lived temporarily. God lived in your midst, and it's great. And so this is the next part Mr. Beaver says, but he's good. He's not safe, but he's good. Right? And that's the, the balance that we have to hold in this. And so we're moving towards that celebration, that encounter. And so the preparation is now. It's looking, it's preparing, it's repairing, it's return, return, return. And so encounter what is this? Holiness, it's getting, again, submerged in the Holy of Holies. How many of you are ready to submerge in the Holy of Holies? You sure? Okay. <laughs> okay. I could go. Want to is one thing, being ready. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Being right, yeah, yeah. I remember years ago, Jim's just had surgery. I remember years ago, I was in, in middle school, then called junior high, and I had an emergency appendectomy. And I remember one morning after the operation, kind of waking up and, and seeing this doctor, he goes, good morning, I go, good morning. He goes, how are you doing? I'm doing, well, hi! And he had just reached in and looked at the bandage, just went, Whoa. So he took me there even though I wasn't ready. Sometimes God has to do that, right? Sometimes it rips it off. So we encounter his presence, but what are we going to celebrate and, and what is behind that? And there is both the fear and the anticipation. And so return where? Return to whom? And then how and why? And the more I was going, okay, God, what, what's this year with return? What are you doing? What are you saying? And it just kept bringing me back to this, to the parable uh, called My Two Sons. Some of you are remembering this, right? You're like, okay, that's why the laugh is there. Do you remember My Three Sons? Yeah. Who is that? Fred who? What was his? Fred McMurray. McMurray, yeah. My three, my three Sons, yeah, yeah. And so it is really the parable of the Father's heart, right? We call it the parable of the prodigal. So I have been, uh, I've been in that and reading that, and then God reminded me that I had this book by Henry Nouwen called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And I don't know how many of you have been exposed to Henry Nouwen, but it's, um, he takes you some pretty intense places. And this is in part an encounter that he had with this painting by Rembrandt called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And as the more as he studied this and tried to understand what Rembrandt was saying, it caused him to reflect on the parable. And the reason I went to this is I jumped right over the first section to go to the section about the elder brother. Because there was something just in me going, there's a key right there with the elder brother. 
that I need to make sure I visit. So we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time here about one father, two brothers. And so the father, and then of course the brothers, the younger and the elder. And of course, they're both lost, not just one. Two lost brothers. And so here's the, the subtitle on this is The Challenge of Getting Home. Because the elder brother has in some ways a bigger challenge than the younger one in getting home. Okay. Um, I need someone to read. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, Ugh. but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Okay, I'm going to have you stop right there. Okay? You got it? This part is about this guy, right? The younger, the maybe unwise one, right? What about this? And does it have any application to believers? Or is this purely, who is this story told to and who is it told against? It's told to both sinners and Pharisees and, and Pharisees, okay, yeah. Both of them were there. Okay, they were there. They were on him, right? About him, yeah, about stuff. And the company he was keeping, if you read that early part of, of Acts, right? And right before this, he read two other parables. Do you know what they were? The lost coin and the lost sheep. sheep. Good, good, okay. And in each case, what happened at the end? They were found. That's not it. Yeah. There was a celebration. There was a celebration each and every time. Big time celebration. Party in heaven. Get down, get down. Right. Again, does this have any application to you now that you have come to Jesus? Let me ask this. Are there parts of your heart that have wandered away? Okay, I mean, yeah. The compelling question Henry Nouwen raises for this, I am loved so much that I am left free to leave home. That goes, remember, this guy already is a son, right? And rebellion doesn't have to be flaunting in the face of everything, but it can be a part of your heart, right? A part of my heart. And it's generally when I take part of my identity out for a walk. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get affirmed for some things out there. And so the overriding question is this, the defining question, to whom do I belong? Do I belong to the Father or do I belong to the world? And so in a time of returning, we've got to go, okay, what parts of me, God? See, this is where getting behind the Holy of Holies is a whole burnt sacrifice, right? <laughs> whole burnt offering. It's a whole. And the challenge is we usually present part of ourselves and we keep part back. And God's like saying, no, I want you all, kid. Return, 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 return. Mm -hmm. I think when you asked that, David and I were talking about this earlier this afternoon, and 
I think sometimes we have been taught it that way, that it was yeah. a salvation thing and the Father was waiting and here we came and that's it. But as you said that, I think of so many times since I was saved that the Father has come running and met me coming home from a far country that I never should have gone to anyway. There you I go. I knew better before I went. There you go. But I went. Yeah. But I was, I mean, I was already saved. I already yeah. belonged to the Father. I was yeah. already... But there have been lots of times that I've looked and seen him come running down. Amen. To me. Amen. And did he wait for you to get all the way back? No. What was he watching for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just for you to turn a corner. Just turn. Just just turn, right? Mm -hmm. you, you do realize, right, you, some of you probably have heard a lot of stuff on this parable, but you do understand how scandalous this was for the younger son to ask for his inheritance. Mm -hmm. It is to mean, I wish you were, we're dead. dead. <laughs> yeah. Because that's, cause even if a father could divide up his property, but until he died, it was, didn't belong to them. So he says, not only divide it up, give it to me. And the insult was huge. Go ahead. Do you know what I mean when I say get set? So I'm not sure what you just said, so that's a... <laughs> get set, so. Nope. Q-E-T-S-A-T. S-A-H. Ra, ra, ra. Sorry. No, okay. <laughs> just sounded like part of a cheer there. I was just, that was a teacher and him. One teacher asking another teacher. This, this is, the rest of us can just get up and leave the room now. Okay. <laughs> it was a ceremony that anyone that wasted their money of the family among Gentiles in Jesus' time this is what the community did. Do you mean Gentiles or Jews? The Jews did to no, those they who wasted spent their money uh, among Gentiles. Among, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Ah. Sorry. And what they would do is they would take a big pot and they would fill it with uh, burnt corn and burnt nuts. And then when the one returned, they would put it out there, break the pot, and say, so and so is cut off mm. from his people. Yeah. So and so is cut off from his people. Mm. That was what, and the father went to the son and gave him all the things of family before the neighbors had a chance to do that. To wow. Him. wow. That, that's what we talk about, that, that the father gave him the ring, yeah. and the sand, right. all of that stuff. Before, before he got yeah. to there yeah, to be right condemned and to be whacked and shunned okay. and okay. yeah. the, and, and, I, and as we were praying and worshiping, the thing that came to my mind thinking about that was the Father validated him before he ever got to a place where he could be destroyed. By yeah. The yeah. Well, now, now turn that around for you as a believer in the community of believers. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't. Don't, don't get lost in history and think that's interesting. Take that now and speak into it now. How does that work today? Still working, still happening, right? We, 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 so, we have a tendency to not want to come back. Yeah. But the Father always says, come, yeah. come. But then we have a tendency like those neighbors to say, okay, well that person, they shouldn't be. They, yeah, 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 right? I they mean, it, it's, in the old days it was called shunning. Today it's called a bless their heart. <laughs> you see, they just got back from sin and they look like trash. Bless their heart. Well, it's, right. it's like when uh, pastors fall. Yeah. Sure. And then, then God restores them. Example: Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger. Yeah. Yeah. And people still shun them because of it, but the Father has accepted them. That's right. And it has expanded their ministry. And if God can. If God, to me, when people talk about them, and I, you're saying God does not restore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, God will restore, but then men and women will oppress it, right? Yeah. You remember, I had a slide last week based on a phrase that um, our friend Sharon Pinnell said, he was humbled by God, but crushed by men. You know, and I think that has application there. Humbled by God is returned, but crushed by man is to go the next step and say, we're cutting you off. So again, you I need... You can see this thing. Sorry? You can see this. 
Caroline was talking about this. If you watched Fiddler on the Roof, yeah, where he said, "You yeah. were dead to me," yeah, and that is that is what that was. Yeah, the good sense. Very serious thing. What does the son do? What's what's the discussion with himself on the way back? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. What, what's what's the speech he rehearsed? Right. I'll just be a servant, right? What's very interesting is he's rehearsing it in his head, but he starts with the word name. He says, Father. So it's funny. He does it, Mr. Jones, Mr. Mordecai. I, you know, he said, Father. So it affirms the relationship, but then says, I'm no longer worthy, right? So it's kind of funny. He, but it's the one thing that he holds on to still in the midst of that is he does still get that he's a son. Because in what he's saying, he doesn't just stop, like I said, and say, Mr. Mordecai, please let me be a servant here. It starts with the word father. In, um, in Henry Nouwen, looking at this portrait, that the, the picture of, of the son is kind of all in rags, but he still has the sword with him, which is the one sign still of sonship. Everything else was lost, but he didn't sell off that. There's even a question whether he sold his hair or what, because he's almost bald. But that one thing he's held on to. And I think this is an important part because of the the thing about, let me see if I can, there's so many points in this book. But this thing about coming back as a servant is something that I think people do. Let's see. He, the son, knows that he's still the son, but tells himself that he's lost the dignity to be called son and prepares himself to accept the status of a hired man so that he will at least survive. There is repentance, but not a repentance in the light of the immense love of a forgiving God. It is a self-serving repentance that offers the possibility of survival. You get that? There is repentance, but not a repentance in the light of the immense love of a forgiving God. Right? He's not understanding the depth of the ability of God to forgive him. Instead, he feels like he's got to come back as a second-rate citizen. Do you get that? Yeah. God, I've screwed this up so badly. I'm no longer worthy to whatever. Right? We, can't, we cannot look down on him. No, but this is what I want to do. is I want to talk about how we ourselves, just so you know. Yeah, no, we can't. But, but see, this is the dialogue he's having with himself. This is with somebody else. And what I'm saying is there's a lot of people that become prodigals, even as believers, and never return. Because they're not ready to really admit the power of the forgiveness of God, right? Because it's extremely humbling. So it's a self-serving repentance that offers the possibility of survival. I know this state of mind and heart quite well. It's like saying, well, I couldn't make it on my own. I have to acknowledge that God is the only resource left to me. I'll go to God and ask for forgiveness in the hope that I will receive a minimal punishment and be allowed to survive on the condition of hard labor. God remains a harsh, judgmental God. He makes me feel guilty and worried and calls up all these self-serving apologies. Okay? But that is not the real God, right? But too often in our brains, okay, well, I'll do this. I'm saying I'm sorry. Listen to this. One of the greatest challenges of the spiritual life is to receive God's forgiveness. There is something in us humans that keeps us clinging to our sins and prevents us from letting God erase our past and offer us a completely new beginning. Sometimes it even seems as though I want to prove to God that my darkness is too great to overcome. While God wants to restore me to the full dignity of sonship, I keep insisting that I will settle for being a hired servant. But do I truly want to be restored to the full responsibility of this son? Receiving forgiveness requires a total willingness to let God be God and do all the healing, restoring, and renewing. As long as I want to do even a part of that myself, I end up with a partial solution, such as becoming a hired servant. And this is important. As a hired servant, I can still keep my distance, still revolt, reject, strike, run away, or complain about my pay. As the beloved son, I have to claim my full dignity and begin preparing myself to become the father. Yeah? You catching some of that? I'm just going to let some of that imprint. So here's the other one. So, Gail, would you keep reading? Yep. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. 
when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants, and one of the servants, and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the bad calf because he had has had him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead, and is alive again. He was lost in his family. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, quick question, just a quick survey. Of the two, who do you identify with, who do you see more of yourself in, the prodigal or the elder? Neither. Okay. Well, just how many of those you see feel like you're more like the prodigal? Put your hand up. Okay. How many more like the el like the elder? Depends on the day. Depends on the day. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Depends yeah. on the day. Okay. I want the dad to do an interesting yeah. thing on this. Yeah. Yeah. Let church. me. Oh, sorry, Gail. Let me let me have that. Thank you. Church, when they ask this. Yeah. Ten percent agree with the prodigal, and ninety percent agree with the elder. Interesting. Okay. Really? They actually did a survey on that? Yes, they did. Wow, 10 and 90 percent. Okay. Didn't know they did that. I'm just curious. What? Um, uh, Sid Roth, he compares the older son with the Christian church today and the younger son being that of Israel that had denounced the Messiah. Mm. And it talks about the prophecy is that they're going to come more and more around to believing in the Messiah that they missed. And that the church is kind of going, you know, you Jews, you, boy, we've been here the whole time slaving for righteousness and in the Son and believing in Him, and now you're going to come around and they're going to be accepted the same. <laughs> and everything. All that. Mm -hmm. Kind of a cool take. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Which really proves that they still think they can do something to get it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we, we all kind of... So, how many of you have had a moment like this with God? Okay. I like the elder son, right? What gives, God? I don't understand. You, you've never had resentment over the way somebody else has been blessed after you prayed and, and pushed through and gave and, you know, you reached down, you scraped in and stuff and you even saw them walking in some craziness and some blatant sin and yet this happened and good happened? You've never had that feeling? Okay, we'll just get you on the list for repenting to Kim, for deception and denial. Pardon me? Pretty sure he's the prophet perceiver. Yeah. 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 I would relate to that because that would make be the enemy's lie to try to get me to question my father. There you go. Yeah. If you don't, if you love him like that, then you There you go. Which just means that you still don't understand your father. Right, yeah, see, this is about two lost brothers. Not just one. Now what's interesting is, how does the father treat when he hears, how does the brother react, first of all? He's angry, he's wrathful, right, if you need the King James. And then what does he do? He does something. He pouts. He pouts and he refuses to go in. A little passive aggressiveness going on here. Fine. Right? Right? Which in Jewish custom was just as bad as the son leaving. That's right. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to show up to this party, right? The abs the, the, your absence is obviously noticed, right? As the firstborn son. Okay, and there is a great party going on, right? The generosity of the father to go out there and meet and just... And again, what I've been told in, other cust in this custom that for the father to even run to the son rather than just stand there and wait. But it's again, this is all about the father's heart, the father's heart, returning, returning, returning. All of this is anchored at 
What are you returning to? How are you returning? And why are you returning? What are the areas of our life where we've been like the prodigal? What are the areas where we're being like the elder? And resentful and bitter because it just doesn't go. I don't understand that, God. If you think I'm not wrestling with that, then you're either not listening to me or you're still in denial. We spent a lot of money being down here. Y'all have poured a lot of money into the ministry. And it's like, okay, God, what's going on? Right? <laughs> okay? God has had my face in this all day. It's a real danger for someone in a, in, in a mercy. Okay? It, read, the, read that book. Look at the mercy and look at the danger that a mercy has. Intense heart for passion. Intense desire to get people into that place. But can become envious, jealous bitter. It's like, what the hell is going on? Right? And I love the brother just zings the dad, right? This son of yours, by the way, did you notice that? Did you notice that? This is right back to Adam. The woman that you gave me, the woman that you gave me, your son, not my brother, but your son, and I love this, goes out and devours it with what? With whores, with harlots, with prostitutes, right? Look up the Greek. It's a woman who gets paid for sex. It's real blunt. It's just not at all polite, right? So he's burned up all this capital and you come back and you give him a party? You know, Stephen, this is a very good lesson for us to remember. I remember when I was born again, I was a wild girl. I mean, I'm, I can confess that now to my husband. And he freed me from alcohol, he freed me from cursing, he freed me from smoking, he freed me, he freed me in such a dramatic awful way. And, and it didn't take me any time to become a, a Bible teaching Pharisee. <laughs> For years I was a Bible preaching, teaching Pharisee. You know, I'd go to the country club to dance with my husband. And I would not drink a Coke all night because I didn't want anybody to think I was drunk. Mm. It took years to break off the older brother out of me. And I want to tell you, he has, he has done that for those mission trips. Mm. He has shown me how he loves being involved in rich mm -hmm. He has shown me how much he loves people in grocery stores and in you know, Debbie, when we go out, you just, you fall in love with people who are broken. Today, I heard some of the most powerful testimonies down in Jacksonville at that conference I have ever heard in my life of people who were so bad, so bad, and God got a hold of them. And they became giants on this earth doing things, not only to make money to bless people, but they came the kind of people that are shaking and moving the kingdom of God around the earth, the whole world, the whole globe. And I just, you know, I just want to say that I'm glad that he has shown me, Gail, you are like the Pharisees. You used to be just like them, the people that judge. And I'm so glad that he set me free. And your teachings have helped to set me free. Set me free from being kind of worried dead. about a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know it. I'm yeah, because all we're trying to do with Gail is call up the glory from the constraints, right? <laughs> no, no. I know. Go ahead. Yeah. And I really, I mean. Now bear in mind, sorry, I just what I said was, which are you more like? Uh -huh. Because I think everybody here has both of these. Right. And that's what I'm saying. I'm looking, just thoughts still going through my head, and just knowing that the time of the prodigal and the him coming to the father, and we talked about like he really didn't know the father because there's not that much forgiveness. How is that possible? But this is a person that's being portrayed as the rebellious. You know, he went off, he did all the wild things, did all that. And yet there's the one who lived at home in the presence of the Father. 
literally continually. And my heart grieves that we can live in the present um, yeah. all there you the go. time. There you go. And not and know my no. father. And then yet I mean in rebellion I can go off and not know the father and come back and there's just not even know that there is the the amount of grace and love that truly covered my sins before I was born. Yeah. You know, and yet I can live in the presence continually yeah. and still not know it. That actually grieves my heart as much yeah. as the one yeah. you know, yeah. both. Yeah. Absolutely. And it is good we, we know that because right that's where I think most of us end up here more often. Right? And we have certain boundaries and well, you know, but that person is just not they're just doing this or you know that church not it isn't even spirit filled. How could God really use or this person is really or you know what? Depending upon your denomination, yeah, but they have a woman preacher there, or they have this, or, you know, there's always something, right? And God's just like, watch me do this. Watch this. That's my kid. Watch this through the five-year-old, right? It's paying attention where the Spirit of God is moving and just being free in that. But what I love about this is that the Father goes after this arrogant, uptight, angry, resentful other son. Both times is the father pursues. The father, <laughs> you know, it's interesting that when I asked you, who is this told to and who is it told against? Because in a sense, and you want to say, well, it's kind of told against the Pharisees, and yet the father goes to the one who is most typically portrayed by him. And it says he pleaded with him. And then he says two things to him that connect right in with the words that went on and what June got. You are always with me, and all that I have is yours. And if there's something that keeps, that will, if we don't get, will launch us into the elder brother syndrome, it's one of those not getting a grasp, grasp on that. Yeah, we, we judging the elder brother. I don't think the father judges the elder brother. He doesn't, does he? You don't see any condemnation with him. He doesn't condemn him. He just says, look. But if you go back and read the language, he says, we had to have a party. It's the, the Greek in there is, is we were all but compelled. We really, it's just, you get the feeling that, that the father has just been waiting for the prodigal to come back to have the party. You know, we're so sober. Somebody came to Jesus, oh good. And look at them, ah, the angels are up there like, you know, ah, double overtime win, you know, scored a three point play from the other basket, ah, you know, just nutsy kind of stuff, right? The vo right? It might be, you've seen that in the fans, right? Where they're just like, I oh, can't believe the turnaround. It's just, oh. you know, that, that there's that level of joy engagement in the heavens. But I think we have to understand that it's when one returns. And so we have to get the degree of engagement of the Father and the heavens when we turn back. When that part of us that's seeking validation, seeking identity into the world and other people's approval and everything else, and we turn back to home and the Father just goes, and the same with the elder son. He doesn't condemn him. It's very interesting. He doesn't say, now come on, get off your high horse. Because the brother says two things about himself. Do you remember what they were? I have, I have what served you. I've worked, worked slave, been also a slave to you. And I followed every one of your commands. So it's like he got the letter, but not the spirit, right? Because he's missing the fact that I'm with you always. In other words, you don't have to do that to prove that you're my son. You don't have to do that to prove or earn my love from me. And you didn't even give me a kid. Everything I have is yours. And it goes back to me to James about you do not have because you do not ask. You know, it's like, it, we, it's like all that I have. And I, and I went before the Father today and said, you know what, Father? I, th I think I'm pretty good that I am with you always. You are with me. That, that part I'm good. But that all that you have is mine, I struggle with it, right? Okay, really? Is that right? Because it's like <laughs> lately it's been a little lean, a little crazy, you know? And, and because of that, when I see something else, and it's like, okay, we're here, we're trying to do this, and I see something else go, it's, oh man, and they got all those people, and I don't know that they're that anointed and do what they're doing. <laughs> okay, man. Bitchy, 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 bitchy. You don't want to be around me in that time. But see, God is, meets me in that and says, it's, it's okay, Stephen. It's okay. Calm down. I got my glory. I'm doing what I got to do in and around the earth. Track with me. Track with me. It says we're to pour out our hearts before him, right? Cast our cares upon him. 
but and again we've talked about this part of what we've lost in the in the westernization of our faith is we've gotten very stoic you go to Jerusalem or go to a Jewish wedding it ain't stoic right <laughs> okay I mean you go to the wall <laughs> okay right you have to understand that it's a fully engaged faith it's not just some cerebral cortex thing okay God you know I mean it is a deep relationship so let me keep going here lost while still at home this is just one of the craziest things because it's always been the parable of the prodigal son but it's really the story of two lost sons right one's just lost at home and this is so often so often where we can get and then it creates the hostility and it also creates the fear then whenever someone is like a prodigal or it creates fear in us when that prodigal part of us needs to come back and we don't want to tell anybody where it's even been we don't want to say about the struggle because the fear of the shunning okay and we got to get over that because the father is clearly over that and then this is a phrase that he used in here Something has attached itself to the underside of my virtue. <laughs> okay, what I mean by that is there's this little, okay, you get what I'm saying? There's a little stinger underneath there. Let's see if I can find this part. I mean, uh, anyway, I may have, have lost that. But the, the fact of the matter is right in the fact when I'm, I'm getting good at, at, at standing against temptation then I see somebody else who gives into it and I feel judgmental about them. Oh, you know, there's sort of an envy of those who go off on the wild hair and get to come back. Well, wait a minute. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. How's that? How's that? How is that? They got to go do that and then come back. Wait a minute. We all get to come back. Yeah, I know, but I, there's still that. You, right? You're all laughing because you know it. it's true. We all do. But there's a sense about somebody else who really goes out and does it. It's like, And they, they don't come back all the way, they come back and, and take what they can get rather than everything. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. One of the amazing points that Henry Nowen makes in the book is that what happens when the young son returns is that the elder son becomes like a foreigner in his own house. He's alienated from the brother because the brother's done what he's done. And now he's alienated from the father because the father's received him. And so now, in his own home, he feels an alien. Mm -hmm. He feels outside. He doesn't belong. And so, let me read this. The only way out of the issue of the elder brother is through trust and grace. Listen to this. Although we are incapable of liberating ourselves from our frozen anger, we can allow ourselves to be found by God and healed by His love through the concrete and daily practice of trust and gratitude. Trust and gratitude are the disciplines for the conversion of the elder son. Mm -hmm. By the way, which conversion is harder? The younger or the older? The older, the older is usually the harder, right? Mm -hmm. The younger is, is easier. When it's blatant there, it's this anger, this frozen anger, this righteous you know, resentment. How dare you? I, sorry. The younger was broken. The younger was broken, and the older. See, I don't think the younger resentful. was totally broken. Yeah. I don't think he was totally broken oh, because he came back because he was hungry and he knew that the servants were better. And I think it was pride that kept him from coming back and saying, "Take me back." Well, he, totally he he the father received him, so whether he was totally broken or not is not something you can actually right. judge. Right, but I'm just saying. So, I, don't, I don't think you can tell from the text that he. I don't know. You have to infer. You know, one of the interesting things about this story is it's very much like Jonah at the end. Have you read Jonah recently? It just ends with the same point of grace where Jonah's ticked off because of God's mercy, this really wicked group, right? And God is left speaking something over him. Should I not have pity on them when they don't know their right hand from their left and also so many cattle? And there's just silence. And it does the same way here with the pronouncement of the Father. We had to party. Because your brother, he puts him back in relationship, your brother, your brother who is dead, is, is now alive. 
and it just and it's just left. And everybody's going, well, what happened? Did the elder brother return? Did Jonah? What did Jonah do? Right? He's in the middle of having a hissy fit up there. Right? So is the brother. And it just leaves it because then we put ourselves into the narrative and go, okay, what would we do at that point? Or would we go, huh? And we go storming off into the dark. And we wait till the party's gone and everybody's asleep and then we creep back in and we, right? I'll show them. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, there's all sorts of things that have been running in my mind. The younger brother who comes and talks to him. Well, you know, you're one of the reasons I left. <laughs> always on me, always perfect, always doing what daddy said. I got sick and tired of it. Yeah. Right? Could you, all the just the dialogues and stuff. But let me get back to here. Only trust and gratitude. Listen to this. Without trust, I cannot let myself be found. See, the brother, the elder brother, could have chosen actually to hightail it up into the fields. Trust is that deep inner conviction that the Father wants me home. As long as I doubt that I'm worth finding, I put myself down as less loved than my younger brothers and sisters. I cannot be found. I have to keep saying to myself, God is looking for you. He will go anywhere to find you. He loves you. He wants you home. He cannot rest unless he has you with him. Well, now he has become the product. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in that brief moment, right? But without having some of the fun on the house, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, that's a story that never happens. Story. So, listen to this part. There's a very strong, dark voice in me that says the opposite. God isn't really interested in me. He prefers the repentant sinner who comes home after his wild escapades. He doesn't pay attention to me who has never left the house. He takes me for granted. I am not his favorite son. I don't expect him to give me what I really want. Huh? Did you hear this? This is a lot of the body of Jesus. It's a lot of me on any given day. Along with trust, there must be gratitude, the opposite of resentment. Resentment and gratitude cannot coexist since resentment blocks the perception and experience of life as a gift. My resentment tells me that I don't receive what I deserve it always manifests itself in envy. This is from Henry Nouwen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. Stephen. Yeah, uh, just Joel and then Martha, yes. It, it kind of reminds me of when, uh, I think Kim can relate, uh, and those who may have talked to her, uh, when people are laden with, with demonic oppression, Oftentimes, they've stepped into a service that has anointing, uh, anointed music, anointed speaker, and just the presence, perhaps even revival, true, re true revival. And they just happen to be at the right place at the right time, and some deliverance is just anoint from the anointing come upon them, and they get to receive. Even though they weren't, like he's saying, they weren't there completely. And, but you're saying, but that anointing came for him. That Father said yes. And I'm reminded, you know, sometimes we get to walk in, in an in a area of deliverance when we really, we didn't go through the, all the uh, ABC through the Z. Steps. But that anointing will just come on through anyway. Yeah. You happen to come, you have to turn into these doors. You wanted some of it, and you didn't know how, but well, I'm going to give it to you. You know, sometimes we just receive, even though, and that's what it kind that's of right. me that's right. too. Well, and you see, you got to remember, we don't know the rest of the story, but this is how I think it would go. The son comes home, and he is completely restored and loved and forgiven. But now the father starts to help him deal with things, right? Okay, there's stuff that you brought back with you. we got to, we got to, you got to break that habit, son. <laughs> okay, that ain't going to work anymore. Okay, you're back here because this is where you belong and this is your identity. But let's remind you how that functions because that's just killing you. So, yes, the grace just pours over him, which is what draws him back, which I hope will draw the elder brother back in, right? To be restored in relationship. But then from there, there will always be more, right? The father will be very gentle, but he'll be firm. At him. Uh, Martha, was it? Who, who had their hand? It was me. I was just going to say that very thing. If I was the elder brother, I would be so, I would feel so wounded. 
I would be just like him. I would, yeah. I would feel so rejected yeah. and um, wounded just so deeply. And it would come out in anger, mm -hmm. but the root of it would be hurt. Yeah. Deep, deep hurt. Yeah. And so, but when the Father came to him, like he did, that would melt me. Mm -hmm. That would absolutely melt me and give me mm -hmm. such a love and compassion in my heart for my brother again if my father came to me like this boy's father came to him he yeah. was so gentle and he told he showed him his love yeah and he said everything i have is yours yeah but look at your brother look what a yeah. mess look what he's done in his life you didn't do this but look what he did mm -hmm. we have to we have to welcome him back yeah. we have to give him a party it would absolutely melt me. Yeah. Amen. That's the, that's the hope, right? And that's what we want to hear is, just remember, I think all of us have parts of both the prodigal and the elder in us. But the end result, let me just, let me click through this because I want to, I want to wrap this up. Oh, let me just give you some, some of uh, the voice of the elder is found in scriptures. See so if you recognize these. There are six days in which to be healed. Come back then. Remember that one? Jesus healing on this app? Okay, just so you know. How about this one? Thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax collector. Okay, just so you recognize him. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. Okay, you're getting all this. Moses said we should stone the person found in adultery. Right? Okay, you get all. Wishing to justify him, this is the lawyer said, and who is my neighbor? Right? This is the elder brother trying to be right and prove himself. Oops. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I get a better quality voice recording. Um, now this is interesting. This parable. These, these who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. This is about the, right the guy going out and, and paying them a different, hiring them at different hours, and the eleventh hour. What's very strange in this parable is the way he pays them. He pays the last first, which means the first ones are expecting a big bonus. And he's like, why are you ticked off with my being generous? But we are. And I just want to say, in the midst of this, any places that we're ticked off, this is a time and a season to return. 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 The whole reason for being in this parable is return. So here's just a couple of more. This was said by one of the disciples. The ointment might have been sold and the money given to the poor. Yes. Right? The excess love given by the woman who breaks a year's worth, $40,000, worth of nard. Let's make sure we're talking real money here. Forty or $50,000 worth of ointment gets poured out on Jesus' feet. Still feel like you can be so easy to, oh yeah, it's a lovely thing. You'd be a little bit shocked too, right? What? Okay. And how about this one? Though they all abandon you, I will not. Peter, right? I just want to show you, just because you're a disciple doesn't mean you can't be the elder brother. So the problem is with the elder brother is that the wall gets built up. We build up the wall from the Holy of Holies by a lot of stuff. But the fact is, is that we have both of these operating in us. And so part of what has to happen is being reconciled to that and bringing them both in to be loved. Because ultimately the goal is to become the Father. See, this is what's interesting, and he goes on with his book and talk about it, is that the center of this painting really is about the Father, right? And that's what we are being called to be, is the one that will deal with both the prodigals and the elder brother. Both the ones that have gone completely off base and the ones that are uptight at those who have. This has been kind of a wake-up call for me. Because I get really angry at a lot of Phariseeism in the church. I get angry when there are boundaries and barriers put between God and the fullness of who they're supposed to be. It's just like, why are you doing? We need every person in the fight. Why are you trying to keep the boundaries out there? Get them engaged. Get them activated. Get them going. There's, we can't make enough of you as pastors and preachers and whatever. We need everybody doing it. I just, and it just... But God the Father is the one who's waiting. He's the one searching. He's the generous one. He's the partier, by the way. He's the one who threw the party. I didn't know if partiers, that's the right way to spell it. But anyway, you got, it didn't spell check me, so I thought maybe it is. And then these two phrases, all you, ha you are always with me, 
and all that I have is yours. This is the painting, by the way, which you need to look at at some point. Because the old man is, the father is an older guy. The son is actually right there, but he's kind of standing upright and his hands folded. It's a very interesting portrait. So this question, what if it is not that we search so hard for God, but simply stop hiding and let God find us? Mm -hmm. Let me read this to you, and then I want to wrap Now I wonder whether I've sufficiently realized that during all this time God has been trying to find me, to know me, and to love me. The question is not how am I to find God, but how am I to let myself be found by Him? You do remember, right, that it was God that went out looking for Adam, mm -hmm. saying, where, where are you? The question is not how am I to know God, but how am I to let myself be known by God? You see, we do the fig leaf all the time. Whether it's a prodigal thing or whether it's a frozen anger thing, we fig leaf it. Oh no, well this part of my life's fine, the fact that I dabble in this, right? Well, you know, okay, and there's this, something has attached itself to my virtue. And finally, the question is not how am I to love God, but how am I to let myself be loved by God? The emphasis is on God's initiative. God is the shepherd looking for his lost sheep. God is the woman who lights a lamp, sweeps out the house, searches everywhere for her lost coin until she is founded. God is the father who watch and waits for his children, runs out to meet them, embraces them, pleads with them, begs and urges them to come home. It might sound strange, but God wants to find me as much as, if not more, than I want to find God. This last line. Wouldn't it be good to increase God's joy by letting God find me and carry me home and celebrate my return with the angels? Wouldn't it be wonderful to make God smile by giving God the chance to find me and love me lavishly? Okay, return. So it's a matter of the shards of our heart integrating in all the fragments and then returning into that holy of holy. So the prodigal is looking for the identity in all the wrong places. The elder is with the father but behind a wall and then this part. He wants to be loved as he wants to be loved, not as the father wants to love him. That's one of the biggest things. But God, if you love me then, God's like, I love you more than that, which is why it's going to be this way. So with this, you locate the prodigal in you and return. You identify the elder in you and you return. You allow yourself to be sought, found, and loved. You vest fully as an heir. And then finally you enter into the process to become fathers and mothers. Mm. See, the goal of the story is to become like your father. Right? That is the goal of the parable. Wherever you are on that, wherever in the continuum, become like the Father. Reflecting that level. That's what's going to conquer. You got it? Father, I pray now for the prodigal parts of our hearts. I just declare clemency in the heavens. I say to where there's a fear of being shunned by other parts of us, the elder brother in us, doesn't want to admit that this part goes awry or by someone in the church, that we will just put that shame and that fear aside and receive the prodigal back because you do. And Father, to the elder brother, to the elder brother parts of us, I say peace, my son. You're always with me. And everything I have is yours. We have to party. We have to celebrate. We have to. Lord, I pray that all those now will come back in the season of returning so we can transition into what's next with your heart for the world, with your heart for the church, with your heart for the legalists and the elder brothers, as well as your heart for the prodigals. Oh, Lord, let us live in this parable till it becomes part of who we are. 
Father, we seal this now, not from developing further, but from being stolen by the enemy. And we ask that it would bring a hundredfold return. In the name of Jesus, amen.